Welcome to the Solo Mo Show, a weekly podcast hosted by Corey O'Brien, the social media strategist at Heat and author of thefutureofads.com. And I'm Adam Helway, CEO of the digital marketing agency Secret Sushi Creative. Each episode, we discuss topics, trends, tactics, and tools related to social, local, and mobile marketing and advertising. Our goal is to give you the information you need to be a better marketer. Today is July 10th, 2012, and this is episode number 12. In this episode, we'll tell you what you need to know about HTML5, we'll take a look at the new Google Plus iPad app, why games and Google Plus don't go well together, Twitter's mobile app updates, the 10 steps to creating an amazing infographic, and review for Gabby, the Facebook app that finds new uses for old data and more. All right. Adam, how's it going? You sound a little under the weather there. Oh, man. Do I sound like I'm recording from, like, Atlantis or something like that? Uh, maybe not <laughs> yeah, yet. For the, people, for the people not watching the Hangout, we could just tell them that you're uh, you're recording this from the Bahamas underwater. Adam is actually scuba diving as we speak. And, uh, <laughs> With one of those, one of those big uh, metal... Helmets, you know, the just the big, huge bubbles on top of my head uh, where, with the portholes on the sides. There you go, there you go. Well, it's actually given us a convenient excuse to keep this episode, episode short because despite every week trying harder and harder to keep our episode short, I believe last week's was actually the record for the longest episode. It clocked in at, I think, like 95 minutes, so... We are going to keep this one short. and uh, Or Adam is going to pass out. That's or Adam is going to pass out, exactly. We have a very finite amount of time before Adam passes out. So uh, with that, we will dive right into it. And actually, the, the first thing we wanted to cover is just a bit of news. So very exciting announcement. This was the result of a bit of hacking over the weekend. But solomoshow.com, the website for the show, is actually now fully responsive. So for those of you... Not up on your web lingo. Responsive basically just means that we now, through some tricky CSS and all sorts of fancy and fun HTML, uh, are serving a single page that actually adapts itself to desktop, tablet, and even mobile phones. So rather than having to reload the page or you know, have different versions of the page, whether you open it up on your tablet or your phone or your desktop, it's serving the same website. It's just going to adapt itself automatically to the size of your screen. So... You can get a little sneak preview of this by loading it up on the desktop and just kind of shrinking and expanding your window, and you'll see all the YouTube videos and all the images. Everything kind of shrinks and expands nicely with the window itself. So very exciting news. It means that if you're on the go and you want to catch up with all the latest and greatest from Solo Mo Show, you can just load up the website. You can watch videos there. You can check some of the back content. You can even watch uh, the live stream. The live page is also mobile compatible. So... Very exciting news, and that was actually uh, something that was kind of automatically updated for us. We use a theme called Canvas. It's put out by WooThemes, and I've been using it for a while, and they did an update to version 5.0 of that uh, theme, and 5.0 was automatically responsive, so we didn't have to do a lot of coding, just had to go through and get some settings set up right. But, you know, that is one of the advantages of using a theme from an actively developed kind of WordPress theming group is they're going to do the work for you to handle things like responsive web design. So very exciting. Check that out and uh, let us know what you think. If you like the new website or if you see anything that we could continue to improve upon, we would welcome that feedback as well. So that's our news for the day. And with that, let's dive right into the exciting topics that we have to cover this week. So Adam, what do you know about HTML5? Uh, we're starting to move in that direction internally. HTML5 is going to be, uh, you know, it's the next generation of the web. And uh, we're going to go over this infographic you got, right, Corey? Yeah, so this was an infographic conveniently titled HTML5, What Marketers Need to Know. So, of course, I was like, well, that sounds like something that's good to share. And this was put out, uh, I believe it was actually a co-production, but Uberflip. Uberflip.com actually created and sponsored it, and then they published it on Facebook. Fastco Create, which is a new website that I've actually been checking out quite a bit lately. They've got a lot of great content there. It's kind of been my new go-to source for a lot of interesting things that haven't shown up in other areas. They've, they've done well with getting some exclusive content. But this was just looking at HTML5 and, and doing so specifically for marketers, which I think is a, a you know, great percentage of our audience. I figured, hey, let's, let's share some of those stats. So like you said, there's, there is a market share issue to understand. And the challenge is that most browsers at this point support HTML5. Unfortunately, legacy browsers and specifically older versions of Internet Explorer, so Internet Explorer 6 through 8, 
do not support HTML5. And Internet Explorer 6 through 8 combined is actually the number one market share. So 28% of browsers in use today are Internet Explorer 6 through 8, and that actually does not support HTML5. So you are going to lose a little bit of that <coughs> legacy support. However, Internet Explorer 9 does support HTML5. So Microsoft, moving forward, Internet Explorer will support HTML5. And actually, every other major browser in use today supports it. So Google Chrome, Firefox, Safari, iPhone and iPad, Opera, and Google Android all support HTML5. So that represents a huge percentage of total users. But unfortunately, you know, the highest single group is that legacy Internet Explorer, and that doesn't have HTML5 support. So you're, well, and, again, and, and so, you know, you'd think that the easiest thing to say was, awesome, it's just Internet Explorer 6 through 8. We can all just update our browsers to 9 because it's available and it's out there and problem solved, right? You'd think it would be that easy. Well, and what's nice about HTML5, so it's not something like Flash where you either support it or you don't. HTML5 is a new set of HTML tags that allow for specific features. So the big features of HTML5 are things like rich media. So that's, uh, photo, or I'm sorry, that's uh, videos and audio that you can actually play directly through HTML. You don't need a middle layer like Flash. So rich media, camera access, geolocation, and then app-like behaviors, so things like local data storage. Those are all big features of HTML5. But again, it's not you know all or nothing. You can actually implement these things, and for the browsers that have HTML5, great. They'll support it. They'll be able to use it. But as long as you're smart about it, you can have fallback code that handles things like Internet Explorer 6 through 8, and when somebody is browsing your site that has one of those legacy browsers, they're going to see a functioning version of your site. It's not like, again, Flash, where they come to your site and it's just a giant red X, and they're like, well, that's useless to me. So it's forward-looking features, but you still do need to prepare yourself to also cater to those legacy devices and those people that just you know, haven't had a chance to update. And it's not even necessarily their own control. Maybe it's somebody who... Their browser at work is still Internet Explorer 8, and until IT comes around and updates everybody, they just have no other option but to use that. Well, that's so, what I was alluding to there, right, is that's usually the problem is, is most, of the, uh, most of the IT departments are very, very much in favor of Internet Explorer as their primary browser choice or have had that on, their, uh, on, the, on the work computers for years, quite honestly. Uh, like I feel sorry for anybody who's still using Internet Explorer 6 or even, even 7, um, uh, and, uh, and so that's, what's keeping a lot of things from completely moving forward. And, and so companies like us, for instance, who have to build out things uh, for our clients have to really take into consideration, like you said, these legacy browsers and understand who it is that we're building it for. Uh, if you build it for somebody who's using it on a desktop, for instance, uh, and it's any sort of, especially like a B2B the, the likelihood that a majority of those folks are likely using Internet Explorer is probably high. Um, so even though they only have 20% of, say, the market share, when you look at the market share of your particular audience, they might have 75% of the actual users that you have with a few fringe folks who might be updating their own browser to Chrome or maybe have Internet Explorer uh, 9 on their own. Yeah, definitely. And you know, one thing that's nice is some of the big boys are already HTML5 compatible. So things like YouTube and Vimeo, which a lot of people think of as, you know, this big Flash application, they're already testing HTML5 compatible versions. You can opt into a beta of those if you want to, you know, basically take a, a deep dive into HTML5. And the market share is increasing. You know, people are both supporting HTML5 and also starting to look for HTML5. And I think this is a trend that's going to continue on in the future. It's not like a, a flash in the pan. These are, again, basically forward-looking features and you know, developers on the cutting edge, companies that are looking to really expand upon their online presence and their, their platforms that they're developing are looking to HTML5 to provide some really great features. And so a lot of customers are starting to, you know, demand these types of functionality. So I think it's, you know, if you're if you're looking a year or two into the future, HTML5 is certainly something that's going to continue to grow, continue to gain usage, and, you know, the, the number of people having problems accessing that content is going to continue to decrease, which is nice. 
Yeah, and the biggest, you know, the biggest takeaway here really to think about is uh, is two things. One, we're really talking about native applications, and we've talked about this a lot in other episodes where, you know, we've got companies out there and brands that have built their own branded application or some sort of application that uh, augments uh, a brand experience that they're trying to provide or, or some, something that's happening uh, in relation to their, uh, their, their company or product, or maybe that's what they are, is they're, they're a startup themselves and they're building an application, that, that those are native applications. They need to be coded within you know, certain programming language in order to natively play on the uh, mobile platform. So that would, the primary ones, of course, are Android and iOS, and then potentially here, uh, if Windows gets their you know, butt off the ground, then uh, they'll be coming out with a platform for developers as well. Uh, that will really be compelling for developers to, to develop on. But HTML5 is it's the web, right? So it's a standard. No matter what, every single person, whether it's an Android device, a Windows device, any sort of device, as long as it has an HTML5-compliant browser on the mobile device, and as you've already said as you've gone through this, Corey, every single mobile browser is HTML5-compliant, uh, then those, those uh, mobile devices can leverage that, and you can build, for instance, one app for all, uh, there are certain things that you don't get with an HTML5 app that you might get with a, with a native app because of the individual platforms and what uh, a native app can access on the device, but it still dramatically increases the interaction and the and the, the rich access to things that are on the device, uh, both on desktops and on mobile devices that uh, you could never you know you could never use at all before. And it's funny because. While we're talking about HTML5 and really hyping it up on one hand, the next story we wanted to cover is actually an application that everybody's really excited because it's not HTML anymore, which is the new Google Plus iPad app. So this is something a lot of users were really anxious for. They said, hey, I want to use Google Plus on my tablet. Uh, and we talked about it when we were covering Google I.O., how Google announced it. And they said, hey, we're coming out with a tablet app. So it's not exactly a surprise, but... It was out for Android immediately, and they said, hey, you got to wait a little bit to get your hands on the iPad app. Well, today was that day. Google Plus for the iPad came out, and you know, I downloaded it, got a chance to play with it, and had some initial impressions that I wanted to share. So, Adam, did you get a chance to check out the Google Plus iPad app? And yeah, so, I did. I did for just did a little think? bit. Uh, I thought... It was definitely different than what I expected, um, you know, in comparison to... I, I know they updated uh, the... Because it was a... a it was kind of a universal app in a sense. Uh, I, I updated it also on my iPhone, and I, I didn't see if they had done anything special to update the form factor of that as well. But, you know, the iPhone one is is very uh, vertical, and it's very visual in the last iteration of it, but it's vertical, and, you know, you're scrolling down. And one of the biggest things, of course, with the Google, uh, or excuse me, the, the Google Plus app for the iPad is that they really leverage the kind of landscape mode of browsing through content. So it almost feels like, uh, I hasten to use the word, you know, something like a flipboardish type of experience. A little, it's a little bit different than that, uh, but it's definitely keeping that visual trend that they have. And uh, I thought it was, uh, I mean, anything is better than trying to run an iPhone version of the app on the iPad. What did you think? Well, it was interesting. One of the cool things that I thought, so actually when I first loaded it up, I had my iPad in portrait orientation, I think it's called, where it's taller than it is wide. Yep. And in that orientation, <coughs> Plus is actually vertical scrolling. So you scroll from the bottom to the top, and then new content loads on the bottom. And, you know, that was kind of cool. You just, you're essentially kind of scrolling through an endless web page. There is no end to it. When you get to the bottom, it just loads up more content. There's a neat little application, or there's a neat little animation where these cards kind of flick into the screen with new photos or new images or, you know, new Google Plus data at the very bottom, and it's this endless scroll. And you know, I was like, all right, well, that's kind of neat. Let's see what happens when I turn the iPad on its side. And I turn it on its side, and it kind of relays it out in this new arrangement, and I go to scroll vertically, and nothing happens. And I'm like, well, that's kind of weird. And then I scrolled horizontally, and away it goes. And I was like, oh, okay. So they've actually kind of customized the experience and the interaction to the orientation of the device, which I thought was really interesting. I haven't seen a lot of applications do that and say, you know, hey, if somebody's holding it horizontally, they want to go side to side. If they're holding it vertically, they want to go up and down. I thought, you know, really great use of code there. And Part of why they did that, I think, is that the new Google Plus app, and we've talked about this before, there's a huge emphasis on images. Images just dominate the app. So 
you know, certain images that get a lot of plus ones, those will actually come in at full screen. They'll browse across every column. So if you're in horizontal mode, I think there's like three columns. If you're in vertical mode, there's two columns. And for certain photos, it'll take up your entire screen. Everything comes on this little card, like I mentioned. So even if it's just text, that takes up the same amount of room that a photo would take up, which makes it, in my mind, look a little odd because you're you're looking at this you know, very visual, very cool looking network and all these images and it's trying to pull in as much visual data. And then when it's just a text update, it's just this little white box with like a black text. It almost looks like it was having some sort of problem. Like it tried to load an image and couldn't and uh, here's your text. And so, you know, I think by doing that, they're really trying to show people, hey, include images, focus on the visual aspect of this network. And, you know, we're not just a Twitter. We don't just want text updates. We want people to be sharing photos or to be sharing links that include images or, you know, just including some sort of visual element to your updates. So just to reiterate, we've talked about it before, but talking about it again, you know, figure out your image strategy, figure out how to attach visual elements to the updates that you're making because people, you know, I think people are going to like this app. I thought it was a very cool way of browsing Google Plus and it's cool because it has this great focus on images. So if you're the brand that's just posting text updates and it looks really ugly inside of this app, you might start to lose people or just not engage people the way that a solid image strategy could. Yeah, and I, I am playing with it a little bit more here as we speak as well, and I had just realized I was only looking at it in landscape, and so now I am definitely seeing how it switches uh, you know, from one direction to another. And I do think that there's some things that they could improve upon for just kind of standard status because there's just suddenly this big white space that, that's there. But, I mean, I think the moral of the story, again, for this is uh, now there's a tablet version for both the iOS and for Android uh, that is, is, is going to hopefully uh, increase the user base of Google Plus a bit um, and have people, you know, the, the experience of using the apps versus using the uh, – the actual web-based version of it is uh, is pretty interesting. I don't necessarily know what their numbers are just yet in regards to how many people are accessing it via the web or via uh, via mobile device. And, and now, we, it's, again, it's only launched in the last, say, week for the tablet, so tablet versus smartphone. Uh, but, but let's just hope that, you know, there'll be more people that are on the go kind of using it as a consumption, a place for themselves to kind of consume information and interact with others. Uh, it'll definitely become a place where I play around with it a little bit more because I find myself not liking to have this little iOS application that's stretching really big uh, and really not optimized for, for the tablet. And one thing you probably won't be doing on Google Plus is actually playing around because a number of the big game networks have taken off all of their games that they had made available for Google Plus. And this is a story that actually came out kind of towards the middle of last month. We just hadn't had a chance to get to it. But since we're diving into some Google Plus stories, I figured this would be an interesting topic to cover because it sort of goes to show the way that both people are using the network and how companies and application developers are viewing the audience that's on Google Plus. So the, hi the headline for this story was PopCap and Wooga pull games from Google Plus. And, you know, PopCap and Wooga definitely bigger game publishers. You know, this isn't like a, a small company. PopCap is huge. They've been around for a long time. They have a number of successful games across a number of different networks. So for them to pull out of Google Plus and say, hey, it's just, you know, not worth our development time, I think is interesting. And, you know, the, the easy conclusion to make is, oh, Google Plus is dead. Nobody's using it. Nobody's playing games. But I actually take this in a little different direction. I think it just goes to show that people are treating Google Plus as more of a utilitarian network than just a place to go and like spend some time and hang out and you know browse around. So you might go to Facebook and say, "Oh, let's just you know look at photos. Maybe I'll play a game. I'll I'll just check out what's going on the wall." But I don't think people are necessarily using Google Plus for that purpose. And part of this could be that you know it's still a more focused network. It's not just everybody and their mom, it's, it's people that really want to be on Google+, and they're there for a reason. They want to you know, view photos. They want to interact with people that they're connected with. They're, they're really there for more of a purpose-driven time frame. It's, you know, they're not, again, there to just play some games and hang out. So as a brand, 
I think this is important to keep in mind. How do you cater to somebody that's there for a more utilitarian purpose and not just there to hang out and play games with you? Um, what's your take on this story, Adam? Do you think this is you know, a sign that uh, Google Plus is maybe facing some additional challenges, or do you think it's just a sign that games don't work on Google Plus and it's time to move on? Well, Google has had a little bit of a problem with kind of fragmentation in regards to how people find uh, and interact with things. Like people in general don't, I, I don't believe they look at Google Plus in the same way as they look at Facebook when Facebook social games came out. It was a, a really heavy part of it. I mean, that's what created companies like Zynga who were really, you know, their, their, their whole, their efforts there, they were putting all their eggs in that Facebook basket for a long, long time. Uh, and, and so I, I don't think that people were initially even re- realizing that Google Plus had this whole section of games. In fact, I kind of jumped in there and I played a few games here and there in the past and uh, just don't have the time to consistently do it. So it's not going to like rock my world, so to speak, when they remove these, uh, these games. But yeah, there was somebody recently and I forgot who it was. And I thought it might've been Robert Scoville who was showing uh, when they posted one thing on Google plus and one thing on Facebook, the exact same thing and showing the amount of, uh, of engagement that they had between the two channels and show and, and, and seeing that they were getting uh, significantly more engagement on Google plus than they were over on Facebook. And we've talked in the past about, for instance, how long somebody spends per uh, per day or per week, you know, how many hours per week or per month that somebody spends on Facebook. And that right now, I think they were talking about, what was it like 30 minutes per uh, was it per month or something, or for Google Plus? I think it increased from something around 10 minutes uh, months ago. Yeah, it was like for people that are actively using Google Plus, I think it was up from eight minutes per day to 12 minutes per day. So it was like a a 30 percent jump or something like that. Okay, so per day, which is which is still which is significant, right? Uh, I think it's significant and. Um, I think, as you said, it kind of it goes back to the fact that people are jumping in there and they're using it, but they're using it for more of a, of a, uh, for as a, as a utility, as a source of information, as a, as a way to interact with a more open network than they are over at, uh, say, Facebook, where I would say we, if we were to take out how much time people are spending on Facebook because they're using it as a social gaming platform, where would that engagement number, the, the time that's spent on Facebook, where would that lie? Would that dramatically increase? Would it only decrease by, say, 20%, by 25%? What? I would, I would hasten to say that it would probably be reduced by over 50%. Hmm. What do you think yeah. about that? Yeah, I think so. And I would say that the big takeaway from this, again, is not to run for the hills and say, oh, Google+, Plus, another sign that it's going away. I would say that, the takeaway is it's okay to be a little more information based, a little more data based, a little more fact driven and share the types of content that people want to, you know, have a little bit of engagement with, but don't try to, you know, say, Oh, how do we get people to play a game for 10 minutes on our, on our Google plus page? I don't think that's the type of information people are there to interact with. So, you know, post photos, post questions, post things that are are going for that, you know, 10 to 15 second engagement or, you know, even something that just, hey, people want to plus one. They want to share with their audience. But, you know, it's more utilitarian. It's not as browse based. It's not as, hey, I'm just going to go to Facebook and see what happens. I think people are there for a reason. They're there to, you know, take specific actions. And so as a brand, you should be aware of that and try to cater your own interaction to meet that need that people have. I mean, look at something like Twitter, for instance, people don't go to Twitter to play games, right? (laughs) They go to Twitter to, to engage with other folks and get information. And, and so there's nothing wrong with that. Um, and, 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 you know, you always ask me, Corey, so does this sound like Google plus is going down the tubes? Is this going to be the end or whatever? And I'm still, again, bullish on it. And we had the conversation about it last last week with the Google I.O. stuff uh, that I, I think that Google is doing the right things and moving in the right direction to just kind of solidify this whole entire ecosystem that they're creating, including the hardware that they're creating with their tablets and so on, uh, which will help kind of bolster what's going on. So I don't think it's like at a tipping point, so to speak, anytime soon. I think it could be, for instance, another six months or a year. 
Um, but I don't, but I definitely don't think it's going the opposite direction and, and on the decline. Yeah, I would agree with that. All right, well, you mentioned Twitter, so conveniently enough, we have a Twitter story for this week as well, so let's go ahead and dive right into that. And this is, I think this is something that we mentioned before, but again, this was something that went live today, so it makes sense to talk about it. And this is Twitter updating its mobile app to add a number of new features, and one of the biggest is the inclusion of expanded tweets. So... We talked about this previously where expanded tweets are Twitter bringing information from outside sources into the application. So we're already seeing it with things like YouTube videos and photos from places like Instagram where if somebody includes a link to YouTube or to Instagram, rather than sending you to that place, it just loads that photo or loads that video inside of Twitter. And with this new application, they're actually doing more content that way. So things like newspaper stories or specific blog posts or even, you know, photos and and the first little snippet of a story that you're linking to are going to get pulled into the Twitter application. And so what they're trying to do here is turn Twitter into sort of a consumption ecosystem. And, you know, again, you mentioned people don't go to Twitter to play games. And I think this is Twitter trying to reinforce that behavior and say, hey, you're here to consume, you're here to get information you know, you're not just stopping by once to go off and check out another site. You're you're consuming information, and we're going to bring that information to you and make it easier. So, you know, I think what's nice is as a brand, a lot of brands are linking to and and highlighting stories and photos and videos that they think their audience will be interested in. And Twitter is now helping you do that by keeping that audience on your page. So you're not pushing people away to other pages they can stay browsing your account and still get all of this additional content in the Twitter app, which I think is, you know, a smart move for them to make. And it's, it's them trying to get more of a user's time on a day-to-day basis spent on the Twitter application. Uh, does this make sense for them, Adam, or do you think this is dangerous that they're trying to corral everything into one application experience? Uh, I mean, I, I think it's needed. I think uh, one of the things that they alluded to on um, the blog post that they, when they were announcing this was the fact that like when you wanted to check out what was going on with that NASCAR hashtag that we talked about a couple episodes back, mm-hmm. uh, when, you know, when they had, uh, during the NASCAR event, uh, they had this page that was bringing in all this, uh, all this content from people who were talking. It was showing people who were, uh, racers, uh, you know, were drivers of the cars and you could follow their accounts and you could check out what was going on and they had this commercial, and they made a big deal of it, and so on, um, you couldn't really effectively follow or have a similar experience on a mobile device. And that kills, you know, a number of, of the users out there. And, it, and if it doesn't kill a number of the users out there now, it actually ruins the experience in the long term because, uh, as we've talked about plenty of times and as a lot of the signs are, point, are pointing to, that um, mobile usage is just going to continue to be on the increase. And if you're not thinking of that, that mobile audience and providing them the same rich experience, if not better than you are on the desktop in, you know, the long run, we're talking another year or two or whatever, uh, maybe shorter, depending on what your statistics tell you of the usage of, of uh, you know, your particular application or service, um, then you're, you're missing out. So what they pointed out is, is that you can, now experience, I think it was like in, in another day or two, there's going to be another NASCAR race, and they were saying now you could actually use the application and follow along a little bit better. I don't think the experience is exactly the same as the web-based experience, uh, but I think that they're trying to move more and more in the direction of, of providing uh, the same kind of richness that they have, so to speak, on their app on their web application currently. One of the other things that they're doing, which I think is really neat and especially useful for a lot of the audience of this show is the ability to actually push tweets to a phone now. So, you know, they mentioned that you've always been able to sign up and have tweets sent to you via SMS, but realistically nobody does that. It's just not a feature that people use. But I think this is a feature that if brands embrace in the right way could actually be really useful. So they're doing this on an account by account basis. You have to kind of choose the accounts that you want to set this up for, but you can select specific accounts to actually push every new tweet to your device. Um, and the, the examples that they give are something like a local news network. So if your local news network was active on Twitter and you said, hey, it's really important that if you know, my local news network says, hey, there's big news that you should be paying attention to, I want that pushed to my device. But 
I also look at this as an opportunity for a number of different categories. And the first one that comes to mind is something like a food truck. So let's say you're a food truck and you're actively using Twitter to let your audience know about the location you're going to be at or a new item that was just added to your menu. You can now walk people through the steps of turning on this notification system inside of the Twitter application. And then every time you post a new tweet, it's automatically going to get pushed to that user's phone. It's almost like a, an email newsletter just handled through Twitter and done so on a more frequent basis. So now every time you post an update, there's going to be a select group of your audience that's allowed Twitter to automatically notify them of that update. And again, that could be used for things like, you know, here's my location, here's my specials, here's, you know, some big announcement that I want to make sure all of my really hardcore fans get first access to. So you know, it, it is something that you'll have to kind of handhold users through, but there is the potential for this to be a really valuable service. And so I think for a number of business categories, this is something that I would definitely check out and say, hey, this might be an opportunity for me to really deepen the engagement with those hardcore fans and those users that are, you know, in that group that might be willing to turn something like this on. Well, and I think you, you you also have to take a few different things into consideration with this model now. Like you said, there there is the whole, the hand holding, and it's going to take some time for for users to get used to this. Uh, especially remembering uh, that uh, I don't believe there's any uh, there's no web version of this, right? So this is a mobile version, and it's not a mobile version that's currently turned on with any other application other than the Twitter app for iPhone and the Twitter app for iPod, uh, iPad. And likely, I think, also the Android one as well. And so with that said, there's a smaller subset of individuals who have this opportunity to, to use this feature, which is a bit unfortunate. But if you're able to, to handhold folks through this process, you know, you, you almost want to consider it a little bit like the uh, – uh, uh, if you're a brand that wants to provide some, sort of kind of like velvet rope uh, uh, content, you know, there, it's special content that's a little bit different than the standard stuff that you would be sharing all the time because, I mean, there's going to be very few folks that are going to really want to have, you know, three or four times an hour a tweet coming from you and they're going to they're gonna say that that's okay. Um, you almost want to think of it in a way like SMS marketing, right? Like text message marketing. I mean, we've talked about that a little bit where almost every single time, if you were to use text message marketing, which a lot of people don't necessarily leverage, um, it's, it's a very different beast. You, you have to get permission. Then after getting permission, you've got to be careful about how often that you're, you're, you're texting somebody because you could very easily have them unsubscribe from you. And so thinking about what, what kind of content you're going to share, you may end up creating a whole separate channel for that particular piece of piece of content. And you've got your regular stuff, which is much more frequent, you know, so maybe the, you've got a, a channel that is just only for the really special stuff that, that happens so that way you don't overstay your welcome with the content that you're sharing with folks. But again, if it's only for a few select Twitter, uh, 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 you know, directly from Twitter, made by Twitter applications versus all of the dozens of other applications that are out there, um, it, it does, it's not going to have the same impact as you, you'd like it to, to have. Yeah, I think that's true. But you know, again, this is something to kind of experiment with, something to have some fun with. And, you know, even I think you make a good point of maybe this is a good opportunity to create a new channel. So, for instance, for the show, we could create at solo mo show underscore live and tell people, hey, we're only going to post when we're live recording a new episode. So go ahead, subscribe to this, turn on push notifications. You know, we we promise to never never send anything else through this but a notification that we are now live and suddenly you know if you're a fan of the show all you're going to receive is a push notification saying hey reminder it's it's tuesday it's eight o'clock it's time to tune into the solo mo show so yeah i think there's interesting opportunities here and yes it is true that you know this is only rolling out to a specific subset of users that are using the twitter mobile app but you know i think twitter is is sort of consistently pushing people towards their own application and they haven't gone as far as to shut off third party applications yet, but they've at least, you know, fired a couple warning shots and said, Hey, we're going to start to put features like this in place. And, you know, down the road, we may request that third party applications either play by the rules and also add these features, or, you know, you're not going to get access to the same amount of Twitter data that uh, the other applications will. So, 
definitely something to pay attention to. And I think, you know, over the next six months, it'll be interesting to see how the Twitter application market share compares to some of these third party <laughs> apps. I agree. All right. So I think infographics are something that I would say we're generally a fan of. Uh, I think both Adam and I enjoy sharing a good infographic, whether it's through Facebook or through Twitter or, you know, collecting them onto a Pinterest board. But you know, what's the difference between a crappy infographic and an amazing infographic? Uh, is very it just, little. <laughs> very little. <laughs> well, I, would, I would actually argue that there's quite a bit because, you know, we're seeing things like automatic info gener infographic generators and, you know, hey, just plug in your Twitter username and we'll create an infographic for you, which is great if you're the first person to stumble upon that tool. But if you're the hundredth person to use that, nobody's going to care. So let's say you're a brand that's that agrees with the idea that infographics can be a valuable asset in this visual focused world that we now live in. And you want to create one for yourself. You want to make an original infographic and you want to make sure that this thing stands out from the crowd. And that when somebody comes across it, they're like, man, that's a great infographic. I want to share that. I want to make sure that my own audience gets a chance to see this as well, because it's so cool. What do you think the steps are to create something like that, Adam? Uh, let's see. <laughs> well, thankfully, we actually have a, uh, a nice little post that was, again, done up on a Fast Company. Oh, site. So thankfully, was, thankfully. All right, great. Whew, exactly. <laughs> this is a uh, Fast Company Design actually put together a post called The 10 Steps to Designing an Amazing Infographic. So I thought we could just run through this real quick. It's actually a great post, so we'll include a link to it in the show notes. Definitely make sure to click through and read the full thing. But, you know, we can go through and kind of summarize and I think uh, share our own thoughts on each of these steps. So... The first thing it says is gather data. And this is something that I would definitely agree is important. A lot of people just want to jump to the end, you know, the end goal. They want to say, all right, let's, I want to do an infographic. Let's start drawing stuff. And it's like, well, you know, what do you even want to share? Number one, the question is, does the data you have deserve an infographic or would it be better represented by just a, a standard chart or, you know, maybe even a, a well-written blog post? So the first thing you want to do, gather data and, so let's say you've gathered this data and you're like, all right, this thing, I've got a lot. I, I need to distill this down into an easy to digest uh, manner. The second thing you want to do is, is read everything. So don't just, you know, go find a bunch of blog posts and, and skim through and say, oh, I've, I've picked up a couple interesting data points and, you know, now I'm ready to go. It, you want to really understand the topic that you're going to cover. So making sure to read everything. I agree with that step. I think it's important. And then the third step is find the narrative. So, you know, don't just gather a bunch of data and slap it down on a sheet and call it a day. I think you want to actually find a single story to tell with your infographic because <coughs> I've seen a lot of infographics that don't do this. They try to share a bunch of stuff and it ends up just being, you know, kind of a collection of pie charts. And it's like, well, this isn't actually that, inf that useful or that informative. It's just a bunch of data thrown on a page and, and you added some colors and you expect me to be engaged. And, you know, hey, you've, you've checked the box of creating an infographic, but it's not going to get the type of sharing and the type of engagement that I think you're looking for. So that's that's one of the biggest benefits of infographics is being able to actually tell a story. You know, have a have a thread throughout that entire uh, data set and 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 all that you're doing with that design, rather than to just simply, like you said, treat it as uh, we're taking a pie chart from uh, PowerPoint that would normally look this way and be very bland. And we're adding a drop shadow when we're making it, you know, really fancy schmancy. That's that's not that's not the point of actually collecting and curating all of this stuff together. It's it's meant to be. Uh, what what is that? Uh, the the uh, the sum of the parts is more powerful than each one individually, right? Yeah, definitely. And you know, the 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 step that they highlight next, which I think is also interesting, it's kind of related to step three, but it says identify problems. So, you know, you've got this data, you've got a story you want to tell. Is that story something that people actually care about, or are you just, you know, creating this thing because you got it in your head that you need to create an infographic? So figure out if the infographic that you're creating solves a problem or answers a question that people are going to have. Uh, step five is create a hierarchy. So again, not all information is the same. It's it's not all equally important. You've got to pick out those really core bits of data and make sure to highlight those because that's you know, frankly, the reason people look at infographics, they, they want to find a couple of key takeaways and they want to be able to identify those easily. They don't want to have to dig through and say, you know, hey, that, that thing's giant, but it's a useless number. Really what I want is this tiny little number hidden in the corner. Find, 
the information that's important and make sure that that really stands out in the infographic. And, and I'll add to this. This is actually one of the biggest problems that uh, people have, period, when it comes to designing anything that has information on it uh, or any sort of design in general. This is what we end up seeing with a lot of people who seem to be very, very happy with everything from their websites to uh, printed documentation and uh, even uh, – uh, I mean, just just about anything that has any sort of, any level of design is that there is no hierarchy and everything is just very very flat and you uh, people don't usually understand how to make something more prominent in order to or or less prominent in order to uh, help tell the story and emphasize things in, in a in a uh, sequential order that makes sense for the person reading things. Uh, and so this is actually a really, really important thing to, to pay attention to in both the infographic sense and any other time that you ever are designing any sort of pro uh, project. Yeah. So now you've, you've gathered the data, you've figured out your story. Now we get into actually creating the infographic. So step six is build a wireframe. And I think this is key. Don't, don't just, you know, fire up Illustrator and start creating this thing from the get-go. You want to lay out your story, you want to make sure it looks good, and you want to really design it before you design it. So, you know, arrange things. Don't lock yourself in too early. Make sure that it can be flexible. Uh, number seven is choose a format. So, you know, there's a number of ways you can show things. You could have bar charts. You could have pie charts. You could have, you know, lines connecting information. Figure out the format and, you know, maybe play with a couple different formats and see what seems to grab you. Test it on people around you. Say, hey, here's, you know, this thing in a, in a pie chart. Here's this thing in a bar graph. Which one do you like more? Uh, number eight is determine a visual approach. So kind of related to choosing a format, you've got to pick a visual style. This is colors, fonts, you know, size, layout. Is it going to be a, a real tall infographic? Is it going to be a wide infographic? you got to you got to pick a visual approach, and hopefully that visual approach is related to the story that you're trying to tell. And, and related to the output, meaning where do you intend to place this particular infographic? Is it going to be on the web? Is it going to be in a printed you know, material? Uh, is it something you're going to give away in a brochure format or on a postcard at a trade show event or something like that? So you want to take these things into, uh, into account when you actually lay the thing out and understand the space that you have available to do so. Yeah, very good point. So step nine, we're almost there, is refinement and testing. So you've created it, you've designed it, it's, it's just about ready, but you know, there's probably still a couple of tweaks you could make. So again, look to the people around you, say, hey, does this make sense? You know, any suggestions for improvements? I think what you don't want to do is just, you know, disappear into a room, create this thing, and then release it on the world and say, hey, here it is. I think, you know, find some people that you trust to give you good, solid, constructive criticism, you know, give you feedback and refine it and test it and improve it and, and make some subtle changes and, and continue to evolve it to make sure that, you know, it's really going to stand out from the crowd. And then when all that's done, you've got this thing, it's ready to go live. The key is step 10, releasing it into the world. So, you know, I think this is, again, a step that a lot of people might overlook the importance of. They've gone through all the trouble to create this thing, and they're like, gosh, right, you know, it's finally ready. Let's just stick it up on Facebook, and everybody's going to love it. And, you know, sometimes that's the case, but more often than not, you've got to do a little work to make sure this thing gets the exposure that you're looking for. So, you know, this is an opportunity to do a little, PR, a little bit of PR, um, find blogs that might be interested in that content, reach out to them and say, hey, I've got this infographic. I'm trying to get it out there. You know, look for channels that you can put it on. Make sure it's on Twitter and, and find, you know, a Pinterest group that might like it or, you know, hey, maybe there's a LinkedIn group that it's perfect for. So go out there, find those channels and just really, you know, put the same amount of emphasis behind promoting it that you did in creating it. The last thing you want to do is spend all this time creating something awesome and then have it kind of die on the vine because you haven't thought through the process of actually getting it out there and getting people interested <coughs> and excited about it. I would uh, hasten to say that, that you should be thinking about that, where it's going to be released and so on early on in the process because that may also help dictate, um, again, it will help you dictate the format, but it would also help you dictate potentially the narrative because in a lot of ways you will work with maybe somebody in your, P, uh, you know, in, in a PR professional, you might be the PR professional, you might be working with a PR agency and you know where you want it to be placed. And, uh, and so you want to actually 
make sure that that content, the format, the, the story, everything that it's that it's uh, it's covering is something that actually uh, that particular outlet that you want to have it be on, whether it be something like CNN or Mashable or uh, in a newspaper or whatever, it's something that's appropriate for them. So it makes it easier for you to say, look, this is the target of where we want this particular infographic to be eventually placed or, or published and shown to the, to, to the world. Uh, let's build it in a way that kind of me meets uh, our needs and, of course, fits for the publication that we're reaching out to to uh, place this and publish it. Yeah, definitely. So hopefully if, you know, an infographic is in your future, check out that article, you know, take some of that advice to heart because I think, again, more and more people are creating these things. So you've got to go that extra mile to really make sure that your infographic is going to be engaging and going to get the response that you want it to receive. All right, so... Figured we'd end the show today with a quick tool review, and the tool that we wanted to look at this week is called Gabby. Uh, it's a new application. It's, I believe, only available for the iPhone at this point, but it's something that came out and you know had a little bit of publicity, but really is doing some innovative things with Facebook. And so I thought it would be interesting to talk about it on the show and talk about specifically what it means for, you know, this kind of layer of data that we've talked about in previous episodes and how really at this point enough data exists that brands and applications can start to do some really interesting things with that data. So Gabby is, first off, if you want to check it out, it's available at gogogabby.com. That's like, G -O like go, go Gadget, you know, Inspector Gadget, right? There you go. It's uh, G-O-G-O-G-A-B-I.com, go, go, Gabby. And what it is is an application that actually takes your Facebook data and slices it and dices it up into interesting ways. So it's only available for personal profiles, which is one limitation. Unfortunately, it doesn't do this for data related to a brand page, which, you know, don't let that put it off, put you off from the application because I think it's really interesting and you can actually test some things on your personal profile that you could then apply to your brand profile. So it's great for getting learnings. It's great for testing things. And, you know, hopefully in a future update, it'll also be able to pull data from brand pages. But for now, you do have to kind of play around with your own personal profile information. But what it does is divide information into three categories. So when you first load the app, there's a bar for something called newest, there's a bar for something called my best, and there's a bar for something called friends. And the design is, I think, purposefully kind of minimalistic because what you're doing is actually filling it up with your own data. So there's a, I'll call it the Gabby button. Uh, you press this button and it randomly generates an interesting slice of your own data that it thinks you might be interested in checking out. So for instance, you could press this thing and it'll say, which one of my photos do my friends like the most? And so you say, you know, I would like to know that. And you click and that runs and it actually returns a whole kind of mini report on all of your photos and it's sorted by the ones that have the most likes. And so you can, you know, dig through that and say, all right, well, that was kind of interesting. And, you know, I want to know something else. So you can click again on this button and say, all right, which one of my friends shares uh, my astrological sign? And click that and run it. And it'll resort your entire friend list and show you all the ones that uh, were born near the time that you were born in the astrological calendar. You know, two examples, very different from one another, but just examples of how it's taking Facebook data, and again, slicing it and dicing it in really interesting ways. So a couple of the takeaways from this application that I thought were important is, first off, it's doing a really interesting distinction between what it calls the best information, and that's sorted by most likes, and it's comparing that to the most <coughs> inspiring information, and it's actually determin determining inspiring by the number of comments. So it's looking at likes and comments as two different signs of interaction with content and saying, hey, both are equally important, but it's just showing you different information about the things you're sharing. It's saying, hey, one one is getting the most likes. That's probably things that people see and they, they just want to click like because it's, you know, quick interaction. They're like, oh, I, I do like that. I want to, you know, I want to give a little virtual high five for that. And then inspiring is something that actually incites people to comment. This is probably a little bit more engaging and it's something that's reaching people on a deeper level. So I thought that was an interesting distinction. I also thought it's interesting to show how the application 
makes playing with your Facebook profile fun and it, it makes it easy to kind of dig into these really interesting topics and do so in a way that's kind of addictive. You know, you press this little Gabby button and it, it brings up a new section of your Facebook profile that you really never would have thought to even play around with. And suddenly you're, you know, you're finding out which one of your friends is the most engaged with your photos. You're finding out which one of your friend's photos is the most engaged with the rest of your friends. Or you're finding out you know, which one of your single friends shares uh, the most birthdays. You're finding out which one of your married friends has liked your photo the most. It's, there's like an infinite number. It's obviously not infinite, but there's a huge number of ways that you can slice up this data. And so, you know, I think it shows that there is a lot of data in the Facebook system and you just have to get creative with how you think about it and how you pull out these interesting learnings and interesting tidbits. Um, but and like this could do it, what, mean, what means that, you know, that that, uh, that a brand couldn't somehow leverage this to create a really interesting experience or be part of the same slicing and dicing in, in their favor. Exactly. So, you know, play around with the app and think to yourself, okay, well, you know, how could I apply these same sort of, sort of categories to my fans? Maybe it's trying to figure out which birthday month is shared by the most fans or which one of your photos is liked by the majority of your fans. And, you know, taking some of these categories and thinking about Facebook in a new way and, and again, using this layer of data to come up with interesting results and then sharing that with your audience. I think that would be the key takeaway from playing around with Gabby and um, you know, just using it to expand the way that you look at Facebook and expand your own perception of the data that Facebook has about its users. All right. Are we in it? Uh, are we in the final stretch here? We are. This is the final countdown. So hopefully this is one of our shorter episodes. I think we did our best to keep it short. Uh, we didn't lose Adam, so that's great. Uh, and as always, we do want to thank the audience that stuck around and, and was with us through this episode and hopefully got a lot of learnings. We tried to fit a number of shorter topics into this episode and really, you know, share some interesting news, share some interesting stories and data that we found from this past week and wanted to share with you. So again, you know, thanks for everybody that's listening. We really appreciate the audience and appreciate those that have tuned in to this, our 27th episode. And um, one thing that we would really appreciate from that audience is if you get a chance, head on over to iTunes and give the show a rating. We have a couple of star ratings and, you know, I think one or two actual text ratings from the show, but it really helps us. The more ratings we have on iTunes, the more the show gets shown to new people. And, you know, it's how Apple bases the recommendations. It's how Apple sorts things inside of their new podcast app. So, if you get a chance, we would really appreciate a rating inside of iTunes. Uh, and if you enjoy the show and you're thinking to yourself, hey, how do I get in touch with these guys? There's a number of ways that you could do that. And probably the most easiest is via Twitter. So you can reach the show directly. It's at Solo Mo Show. Or I can be reached directly at Corey O'Brien. Or I can be reached at Secret Sushi. And we encourage you to get in touch if you have questions or you want to suggest topics or you want to give feedback or even if you just want to say hi. You know, feel free to reach out. If uh, Twitter is not your style, feel free to do so via email. We are show at gmail.com. Uh, and then you can also connect with us, of course, on the usual places at uh, Facebook. We have our Facebook page, Solomo Show on Facebook, Solomo Show on Google+, and we have a Pinterest board on Pinterest. You just search for that on Pinterest. And all of our YouTube version of our shows that have, uh, in fact, also we're on YouTube, but for the most part, we are... We're everywhere but MySpace. So uh, check us out, and uh, you should be able to find our episodes or be able to contact us and uh, see what we're talking about in between shows. There you go. And if you heard one of the links that we were talking about today and said to yourself, hey, how do I check out those links? There's a number of places you can find the show notes. First off is solomoshow.com. That's probably the easiest. That's our main website. Each episode gets its own post on the blog where we include all of the show notes and links to things that we discussed today. And also, you should be able to view it in your podcast player of choice. Just look for an option to view show notes. And again, it's all the links to everything we discussed today and a great resource if you want to follow along as we're talking about various stories and you know examine it for yourself and really take in the information that we are sharing with you on a weekly basis. And with that, we will put a wrap on this one and see you guys again next week. Take care.